M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Welcome to episode 145 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. I'm your host, Pete Strzok. Hey, Pete. I'm Allison Gill. Uh, We have a great show for you today. We're going to be speaking with CNN legal analyst and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, Norm Eisen. We're going to talk about the latest in Fulton County, and we have updates on the New York Attorney General civil fraud trial, including upcoming testimony from the adult children, Junior, Eric, Ivanka, and then, of course, Donald Trump himself. And we have some Trump violations of the gag order in that case that we'll talk about. And then later on, we have some updates on Rudy, Peter Navarro, and the Republican House, including the election of the new speaker, and some more news about George Santos. Additionally, we have new text between the Cyber Ninjas CEO and an indicted Michigan lawyer. Yeah, but first we need to thank our Hall of Fame patrons. And beginning next week, we're going to start shouting out the patrons that have joined us in the last few weeks. But for this week, we have big thanks to our Hall of Famers, Fran Reichenbach, punk rock liberal, Maria Tovar, Suzanne Ashworth, Tiffany Trump was adopted, Caroline Komen, and Cindy McNary. Uh, All right. Thank you so much. You make this show go if you want to become a patron and, and access our happy hours where you can ask me and Pete anything or you know, get VIP tickets to live shows when we go on the road, if we're going to do that, which maybe we will soon. Um, Just go to patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod. That's A-I-S-L-E 45 P-O-D. All right, let's start in Georgia, Pete, with CNN legal analyst and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, our friend Norm Eisen. Welcome, Norm. Hey, Norm. Hey, guys. It's wonderful to be with you. I know you as human beings, so it's amazing to me to hear your very professional podcast (laughs) voices. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's funny. I'm so glad that we have you here because I have so many questions about uh, these these plea deals that have gone down. We've got four now. We're down to 15 co-defendants in Fulton County. We started with Scott Hall, the bail bondsman, and then Sidney Powell, uh, closely followed by the cheese, Ken Chesbro, who didn't want to stand alone and uh, have to face his uh, speedy trial by himself, I guess. But no, he did because he filed for severance. But regardless, he, he, he also pled. And then we had Jenna Ellis. And I wanted to ask you, Norm, how these particular plea deals, might, you know, impact the fact that some of these people might be on the hook for charges in other jurisdictions and, you know, not just federally, but maybe in other states. Uh, and, you know, because I, I thought if, if it was just in Georgia and they got these plea deals, they wouldn't be able to have the Fifth Amendment at their disposal because they wouldn't be af- at fear of of uh, being indicted because they have this transactional immunity. But they could be on the hook elsewhere. So does that mean that when they testify in these proceedings, as they, as they have to if they're brought to the stand, that they can plead the Fifth? It may, but I think the more likely endgame for those who have pled guilty in Georgia is a uh, forced cooperation. As I explain uh, in the case of Jenna Ellis in a uh, new New York Times op-ed, you're going to be very, and if anything, um, Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell are at more risk of special counsel Jack Smith requiring them uh, to testify. Once you've stood up in court and said, I'm guilty, 
you don't exactly have the whip hand in negotiations <laughs> with the special counsel. He's identified Chesbro. He's identified Powell as uh, unindicted co-conspirators. And um, in my view, that means he's coming after him. He wants to get Trump out of the way. But when he comes knocking, they're going to have a pretty tough time uh, resisting his blandishments. So, yes, technically, they'll be able to take the fifth. Uh, but um, he then will be able to potentially utilize some of the information that they're providing in Georgia. So I think they've started on the slippery slope. Ellis almost certainly is going to be subject to uh, uh, being required to testify. And um, uh, so I think the future is uh, murky uh, for uh, these individuals uh, to be able to avoid telling the truth about uh, their participation in one of the most uh, damaging political conspiracies uh, in American history, second only to the Civil War. If So let me follow up on that. If you were any of their attorney, would you allow them to enter into a plea agreement without at least trying to have some sort no. of universal res resolution with the feds? And do, does that make no. you think that there are discussions that have already taken place with Jack Smith and his folks? Pete, between us, we've probably got, well, we got well over half a century of criminal litigation experience, right? And, um, um, you know, when you hang your client out in a state courtroom saying, I'm guilty on, on, on national and international television, you know, you like to know you've wrapped up all the different sources of exposure. Indeed, the more normal thing is you go to the feds first, you cut a deal, and then you you try to deal with the state situation. So I think that it was unwise to seek a speedy trial, to rush ahead. Um, they did get no jail pleas. That is Bonnie Willis's MO. She will give you a no jail plea if you provide some level of cooperation. That's what she's got. She's got recorded statements from everybody so they can't wriggle away. Uh, and she's getting different forms of important cooperation from those who've pled. But uh, it's unusual lawyering, to say the least, and it leaves the clients quite exposed. Yeah, and uh, talking about Sidney Powell a little bit, she's gone on social media now. First of all, she kind of has a history of blowing up plea deals. If we talk about Mike Flynn and, <laughs> and what happened um, with that, you know, when she was representing him. Um, but she's now going on social media saying she was uh, tricked into uh, pleading guilty or pressured into it. Could these types of social media statements endanger the deal that she has? And what does that look like if it gets revoked? If you look closely at her statements, I think she is uh, so far on the right side of the line. You know, she's not repudiating her statement. Some of the more critical utterances have come from, apparently from others in her orbit, like from a newsletter her organization releases. Um, if, if she were... Um, if she were to breach uh, the terms of the plea agreement, um, then the not guilty plea would be off the table and she would be back in the soup. Um, but they would be able to use her uh, statement uh, against her, at least arguably. So um, I think you're going to see her try to walk that line. And it, it hasn't been anything yet that has undermined the huge... Uh, damage that has been done to Trump's case by her guilty plea and by the press coverage of the guilty pleas. You know, it's a, it's as I wrote in the Times, it's a this is a one two punch for Trump because there's the court of law where he's losing ground, and I, I explained to the Times I thought the Ellis plea was the most devastating there because her cooperation is the fullest. And whether she means it or she's just a great actress, she's a very, you know, she gave a courtroom statement, very potent witness. Um, but it's also the court of public opinion. 
where people are going to start noticing, wow, a lot of people are pleading guilty. Maybe this isn't such a bogus prosecution after all, or at least I'm hoping that's what people say to themselves in MAGA world. And these were MAGA figures par excellence, uh, pushing Trump's factual falsehoods and that he actually won and his legal falsehoods that the vice president could use fake electoral certificates to deny Biden the presidency on January 6th. So, you know, we're looking for that traction in MAGA world. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if if any of that sets in or among independents uh, in the weeks ahead. Well, we want to we want to ask more about Jenna Ellis and more about um, about Fulton County. But we do need to take a very quick break. Uh, Norm, will you stay with us? Of course. Awesome. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. So, Norm, I want to follow up on that, the, the idea of the impact of pleas. There's been some Rolling Stone reporting, I think, at least that indicated that Trump and his team were getting ready for even more pleas uh, down in Fulton County, at least. Do you think that's possible? And do you see anybody in the, the top tier of the 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 Mark Meadows, Jeff Clark, Rudy Giuliani level taking a plea? Or, or what do you make of that reporting or future pleas? No, I think that the uh, um, uh, the the big four who were at the top of the indictment, Trump, Meadows, uh, Giuliani, and Eastland, um, are not going to be in the first wave of plea deals unless they call the DA up and offer something truly extraordinary. There's been press reporting that um, they haven't received any overtures. And that makes sense to me because, you know, <laughs> Pete, you know, well, prosecutors like to go up the ladder. They don't like to go down the ladder and they don't like to like, take little baby sidesteps on the ladder. They want to be climbing. And those four are the reason you're giving pleas to be able to build cases against the top four. I think Chesbro um, was important uh, because he really is one of the few. You needed Chesbro or Eastman to really be able to be the tour guide through the flawed legal theory. Now we have Chesbro's lawyer coming and saying, oh, we, he never thought Trump won. <laughs> so, you know, Chesbro has made a significant break from MAGA world. He's dead to MAGA world. He said Trump didn't win. He never thought Trump won. So that's Chesbro. You know, in terms of where I'm looking next, um, she has plenty of fake electors. There's, uh, you know, a large number of them who were not charged. They were duped. Then I'll go through the electoral fake elector conspiracy that Chesbro pled guilty to also. I'm looking for a co-conspirator in the, uh, the pressuring of the election workers Miss Ruby and and yeah, Ruby Freeman and, and Shea Moss, uh, Miss Ruby and Miss Shea, uh, they're the they're the ones who would. Uh, th that's the place where you need a cooperator to say, hey, here's what happened. Once you get that, you really have all the main pieces of the case. Somebody who can talk about them. Uh, Hall can talk about, about Coffee County. So can Powell. That's the intrusion on the voting machines. Uh, Powell and Ellis can talk about there's no factual basis for seeking these fake electoral certificates. Chesbro and Powell can talk about there's no legal basis for seeking the fake electoral certificates. And it, it really gives you coverage of all of the main areas of the conspiracy. And that's what you want if you're a prosecutor. You want a witness who's going to go along with you and not fight you as you tell this story to the jury. Does your gut tell you that we're going to see this trial before the election? No, my gut is unsettled on that one. You know, at CNN, there's a running joke about Norm's crystal ball because <laughs> I've, and I, I, I like to say, I never predict my crystal ball is more like a uh, uh, calculator. I'm analyzing the current odds of things as of today, based on the information, the evidence, the facts, the law that we have. But I've, I've had a pretty reasonable run. As both of you know, I've written four large model prosecution memos recommending prosecution in the four big criminal cases. I wrote a long civil 
uh, case memo uh, that I published more than two years ago saying that Trump ought to be prosecuted civilly for his uh, allegedly fraudulent financial statements. Um, that has come to pass. Uh, so I've got a pretty good track record on the big questions. I think it's it's very un, my my gut is like uh, like when I have one manicotti too many at lunch, a little unsettled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just I don't have a strong feeling because on the one hand the judge the judge just got a five month uh, opening in his trial schedule he had five months set aside for Powell and Jesbro. Um so you could work something in there on the other hand we're just four months away from the May trial then you have or sorry from the March trial in D.C. Uh, of the election, federal election overturn case. Then you have the May trial, also federal, in Florida of the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. I guess if you if you held a gun to my gut, I would say probably um, before that the most likely landing place is after the documents trial and before the political season heats up in earnest, dodge the convention, Put that trial on over the summer. You know, the DA is being cagey. She hasn't asked for a new trial date yet. And I wrote about this in my Times piece. You know, when is she going to ask for a new trial date? So uh, it's a lot of moving pieces, but I would think 2024, work it in before the, you know, the peak election season, September to November. Yeah, so say Norm Stradamus, I think is what we'll call you. Yeah, um, yeah I love that. <laughs> feel free, take it, it's yours. Uh, I can't use it. My name is not Norm, so. Um, let me ask you a question about some of these plea deals that we've seen, because the, they're a little different. First of all, Ellis and Chesbro pled to a felony instead of a series of misdemeanors, and I was wondering if that's just because they didn't go first. And then something that has really stuck out to me is that all of them, lawyers, wanted to have the language moral turpitude struck from yeah. their deals. And I was wondering, because I've heard that brought up a lot in bar association uh, things, like people trying to, you know, who 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 are working on being disbarred or, or somehow punished yeah. or those by the bar, then that language comes up a lot, moral turpitude. I was, is that why that these lawyers wanted that, that language stricken? And, and then talk a little bit about what plea deals in the future might look like, because we might see some jail time in some of these, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I think eventually, if you look at Fani's history, you know, plea deals uh, like uh, fish do not get better over time. Uh, so it, it, it's going to deteriorate. The quality of plea deal that's available on the shelf, shelf is going to deteriorate. Um, the reason for the moral turpitude language is just to give these lawyers a leg up as the bar is considered disbarment. Um, crimes of moral turpitude do typically trigger. It's just a little different. Every state does it a little differently. So it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to dodge disbarment. Um, uh, but it helps. Jenna Ellis has already been censured for her participation in the big lie. I helped file that complaint in Colorado. It'll be interesting to see now that she has a felony on her record. And if you look from Sidney Powell to Chesbro to Ellis, even there you see this, this trend of slight toughening that's starting to go because... Uh, Powell could get away. She went early. She could get misdemeanors. Chesbro and Ellis were required to plead to felonies. So, you know, a felony guilty plea is not helpful to retaining your bar license. And we'll just have to see how that turns out. And different bars may do different things. Don't forget that Eastman, who has not pled so far, not pled guilty, has a standing not guilty plea in Georgia. He has this bar member proceedings that are actively that have been weeks and weeks of trial before the bar judge in California, just like an administrative law judge. So, um, you know, sometime this year we'll be getting a ruling from her, her on whether uh, disbarment is in order or not for Eastman. And that also will help set the tone, moral turpitude or not. Hey, so I did want to follow up because you've done so much work with, with the bar and ethics in particular. How would you 
sort of stepping up to the the 35,000 foot level, how satisfied are you with the ability of the various bar processes to hold attorney misconduct to account? I mean, New York moved very quickly with Rudy. Texas appears completely flubbed, whatever they were doing with Sidney Powell. How are, are, are you content wow. or are you, are you discontent? How, how, how do you feel about all these proceedings? I'm not a contented person by nature, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it in my 60s. I'm in my 60s now and I'm working on it. Um, I think the bar proceedings have been of different quality. I'm I'm more than pleased that the California bar where I also helped um, file the complaint that the bar acted on against Eastman that they've taken disbarment extremely seriously and they've had a full trial. It's actually been the most elaborate trial anywhere of the issues around the attempted coup uh, of 2020. So you have to give them full credit. They, I was a little discontented initially because they were not fast to act on our massive, too massive a complaint and a uh, follow up two massive filings replete with evidence that we put before them, and then they got with it. They've been great. Um, Texas, uh, the there were some technical issues. The bar filings were not all that was called for in the disciplinary proceedings against Sidney Powell, and in part, those proceedings were avoided because the bar's filings before the adjudicative authorities. Uh, we're lacking in some details. That's on appeal now. We'll see how that turns out. We'll see whether the new plea enables uh, folks to get a restart. In Colorado, the bar authorities were a little easy on Ellis. They gave her a censure. They didn't disbar her. That was before the felony. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, uh, New York was fast to suspend Rudy, but he has not been disbarred. He's just suspended. Mm -hmm. D.C. has uh, taken action against I am reciprocal action and on and on. As you go through the you go through the people, you know, there's dozens and dozens of these lawyers um, who have evaded any responsibility whatsoever. So I can't say that that does anything for my dyspepsia. It makes me reach for the <laughs> Pepto. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's an extremely varied landscape around the country. Yeah, agreed. Um, finally, before we let you go, uh, Rudy Giuliani lost both of his Fulton County lawyers um, after his other lawyer, Costello, sued him for $1.4 million. Uh, and they say that they haven't received millions of dollars in legal fees, but he picked up a lawyer. Um, how, how much trouble is Rudy in here? Because it seems like he's not going to be offered a plea deal. Uh, and he's on the hook in several jurisdictions his his law license is in jeopardy in New York and D.C. has been suspended pending the outcome of that. But he seems like, I mean, almost in, worse off than Donald Trump at this point. He's in substantial danger. He's playing for time. He's not a youngster. If Trump or another Republican should be elected, we can't ignore Trump standing in the polls nationally or in key swing states as got... Uh, we're spending a lot of time on our digestion today as gut wrenching <laughs> as as gut wrenching as the thought, the mere thought of Trump's return is. Um, you know, Rudy is is uh, playing right now is attempting to play a delaying game where Trump gets into office federally. I there orders DOJ to throw out the case against him if it still exists or pardons himself and others. So Rudy wants to get out from under his federal exposure. If he pleads guilty, that's going to be pretty tough to do. Um, that was part of the foolishness of these fast guilty pleas uh, for Chesborough. On the other hand, Trump does not have federal uh, pardon power over the state cases, right? So maybe he's got an argument. I think it's a losing argument. I don't even think he can pardon himself on the federal cases under constitutional law. Maybe he's got an even more remote argument that he can't be prosecuted while he's in the White House. 
uh, criminally. That's one of the reasons that I think we may see that criminal prosecution this year in Georgia, uh, this coming year, I should say, 2024. So Rudy's right now just stalling. He's just trying to keep all the balls in the air. He did find a lawyer, lives three outside, uh, three hours outside of Atlanta in the Georgia Hill country. That's his new lawyer. Uh, and <laughs> What um, could go wrong? <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, he's down to the, he's, he's operating on fumes. So maybe he breaks, but- you know, the state isn't breaking down his door because he's so, so culpable. I wouldn't be breaking down his door either. He's not. He doesn't seem like it doesn't strike me as like the best witness. So and he's he's doing everything he can to not hand over stuff in his civil defamation case from Ruby Freeman yeah. and, and Shay Moss. Like he's willing to pay fines and pay sanctions and have a default yeah. judgment and, 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 and to avoid handing over whatever it is he has. True. Yeah. yeah. Should come down. You uh, come down to D.C. and are you're in D.C. right? You can go to watch Rudy in trial in the beginning of December. He's got to show up for uh, yeah. Shamos and Ruby Freeman. Yeah. I think like December third. It's or really something that starts. It's really uh, it's re- really remarkable to see how um, accountability is setting in for the lawless behavior of these folks. As I wrote in my Times piece, Rudy must be one of the ones who felt sickest about the Powell, Ellis, and Chesbro plea, because those are three people who worked very, very closely uh, with uh, Rudy Giuliani, and uh, it's a triumvirate of trouble for him. Yeah, that's that's the elite strike force team, and the only one who hasn't pled is uh, Rudy. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody else has said said it was a bunch of BS. Well, thank you so much for yeah, joining us you. today, uh, Norm. It's been eye opening and enlightening as always. Um, we're everybody you can catch Norm on CNN and follow him on social media. Uh, and I really highly recommend you read some of these model pros memos that that he worked on. They're just fascinating how closely they align with what actually. Has happened because, as we know, he's Norm Stradamus. So we appreciate you. We appreciate your time, and uh, we hope you have a great day. <laughs> thanks, Alice. Right. And thanks, Pete. See you soon. Hey, everybody, stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. I, I love when we get to have Norm on. He's so funny. <laughs> He's so fun to talk to. Yeah, he is. And just super, I mean, just has a great perspective on sort of everything and ability. I think when, you know, kind of sit together and break down how all the different people playing speak to different elements of the charge defenses, he approaches that in a really just such a very common sense sort of way that is easy to follow. And so it's, he's great. Yeah. And I- and offline, you told me a little a tidbit about Wes Anderson. What was yeah, that? Yeah, so so unbelievably <laughs> enough, I, I, if you go to Wikipedia, the if you're a Wes Anderson fan, in particular the Grand Budapest Hotel, Deputy Kovacs, played by Jeff Goldblum, was modeled after uh, Norm. That was like apparently, this is according to an interview I think that Goldblum gave, that uh, Wes came to him and said, if, if you want to know who your character is, go to Prague where... where <laughs> ambassador norm was the uh, was the u.s ambassador there and that's where i want you to be so <laughs> that's probably as you know if your life is complete when you can be a uh, you know a significantly sort of interesting and notable character in a wes anderson <laughs> movie that's spectacular so now the goal yeah. is we've got to get wes to come on the show and we can talk to him about his, his perspective of all this <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, we need we need i i've always said i've long said that if and when the definitive 2016 movie about trump and russia and the entire election is made i either want either the coen brothers or wes anderson to direct it those are those are my two choices <laughs> because it's both a dark farce if you will that they have the perfect flavor of what i'm looking for when it comes to retelling that story yeah the coen brothers would be great they would be awesome um Cool. Yeah, or Wes Anderson, definitely. Because then, you know, then Jeff Goldblum can play Norm Eisen again. (laughs) 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 All right, let's head up to uh, New York. The civil fraud trial is going on there. It's going very poorly for Donald. Uh, The Trump family, uh, first of all, Ivanka tried to get out of testifying. She was denied. She will have to testify. Um, they, they were saying, you know, she hasn't worked for the Trump org since 2017. She doesn't even live in New York anymore. And they're like, I don't care. She's, she's testifying. She's a material witness to this case. Um, and the, the dates now are on November 1st on Friday, or excuse me, November 1st, Wednesday, that's today. Don Jr. will be testifying on November 2nd, tomorrow, Eric Trump. Then 
Ivanka was supposed to go Friday, but she's actually going to be moved to after her father. Um, and uh, that, that's an interesting choice. I have, I've, I've seen that news, but I haven't found out why yet. But, er, uh, but she's going to go on November 8th or 9th with Donald set to begin his testimony on Monday, November 6th. He is taking the stand. And I have the same question for you that I had for Norm about these, the, the plea deals down in Fulton County. Will they plead the fifth? Because, you know, we've talked about where's the IRS? Where's the Southern District of New York investigating federal tax fraud? for the Trump organization. We know the Manhattan DA is currently, uh, according to Alvin Bragg, still investigating uh, the Trump organization tax fraud stuff and the and the valuation stuff. And he might have been waiting to go uh, until after the civil fraud trial is over. But it seems to me they're all on the hook, potentially, f- at least in, in Manhattan, in the at the DA's office, but possibly federally. So I just see them taking the fifth over and over and over and over again. But now that allows this judge, who is the trier of fact in this case, to draw an adverse inference. But I mean, what do you think? What are your, what are your no, thoughts? I, I, would, I would fully expect them to do that. I mean, Trump has already demonstrated that, you know, a lot of the time, certainly with uh, E. Jean Carroll stuff, that he will, when he is personally implicated, that he has no hesitation in taking the fifth. And despite all the bluster, I would be surprised for exactly the reasons you articulate, not only in New York State, but at the federal level, there are a variety of investigations and not just the, you know, the January 6th and, you know, probably not so much the the stolen documents or the, uh, that are done in Fulton County, but just ongoing investigations, which may be looking at exactly the same, uh, topics. I don't see a lot of upside in testifying, even given that it absolutely, if you take the fifth, you have that adverse inference being taken from that in the civil context. But I think they're already, I think that's probably already baked into the equation that they're assuming the judge is going to do that. So, I mean, you know, do they do it selectively versus I'll answer some questions, but not the other. First question to, to Don Jr. would be, you know, if I'm the prosecutor, hey, in the last 30 days, have you taken any controlled substance that would impact your ability to testify truthfully here today and make him sweat a little bit? But, uh, you know, so I hear. <laughs> He'll take the um, fifth on that. <laughs> so, so, but I, I, you know, do they want to play cute and answer some and not the other? I don't know. I mean, we'll see the fact, you know. And then the other question is, do they, once they indicate a willingness or that they're going to take the fifth, does the state nevertheless ask them each and every question and make them invoke each time? Does Judge Ingram say, if that happens, hey, look, you know, they said they're not going to answer any questions, stop, um, rather than just, you know, going through your 40 questions and having them in, take the, the fifth each time. But I would be, I it, again, guessing is worth nothing. But if I had to, uh, my my bet is that they don't say much. Yeah. And then, you know, you say, well, I want to get all these questions on the record because I intend to draw uh, adverse inferences on these questions. And then you could have a, and well, well, let's just assume, (laughs) you know, going forward, but that could leave a door open for Trump to say it's unfair, rigged, but which he's going to do anyway. But speaking of those kinds of posts on Truth Social this past week, he was fined twice Mm. for violating that gag order. Um, that this very limited gag order that uh, Judge Engoron imposed on Donald Trump about talking about his court staff, not himself, not the prosecutors, not at New Yorkers, not Joe Biden, nothing, right? Just his court staff. And um, there was an inadvertent, quote unquote, post left up on the campaign website that was identical to the true social post that created the gag order in the first place about his law clerk. And um, Chris Keyes argued, oh, we didn't even know it was there. We, I mean, yeah, we emailed it to like 25,000 people and 3,000 people opened that email. But like, we didn't even know it was there. And he's like, all right, $5,000 fine. Uh, and then during Cohen's testimony, Trump went out and gave a, spoke to reporters on the courthouse steps and said that the person, the judge is very biased and politically motivated and the person, so is the person alongside him, maybe even more so. And that got back to the judge and the judge was incensed uh, because the judge felt that he was talking about his law clerk again. And and the reason that he, the reasoning that he said it was his law clerk and not Cohen, who was on the stand testifying is, first of all, the person testifying is not alongside me. And second of all, you've invoked Cohen's name multiple times. Uh, so I know, and he's, and he says, as the trier of fact, 
I find you to be, he brought him on the stand mm -hmm. and asked him, Do, were you talking about my clerk? No, I was talking about Cohen. As a trier of fact, I find you to be not credible and find him $10,000. And by the way, those two instances of gag order violations showed up in the Department of Justice's filing uh, in, in D.C. to lift the stay uh, that Judge Chutkin had, or to, you know, to oppose a stay on the on the limited gag order there. And today, uh, as we record this, she she lifted that gag order. So, or lifted, the, excuse me, lifted the stay and reinstated the limited gag order there. And he's very upset about that, too. But that didn't go well um, for Donald. It's not a good thing when the judge who's tri who's deciding your case in a bench trial finds you not to be credible. <laughs> <laughs> right. And particularly in the context of violating, you know, an order of the court. So this is not I mean, I don't think that, you know, Trump had anywhere. It's not like he had a reservoir of goodwill with the judge that he's at risk of you know, <laughs> jeopardizing. I mean, he's already you know, there's nothing there. And I think the judge understands full well about, you know, Trump, his credibility and his behavior. But it, again, from the standpoint of, you know, if you're watching this and the amusing thing was that, you know, somebody put up on I saw it on Twitter, the you know, Alina Habba's law firm cut a $15,000 check for the 5000 and then the $10,000 fine that, you know, so that's been paid already despite all the protestations. They went ahead and coughed that up. But it's not, I, it just, it, there, there, it's strained credulity even when Chris Kyes was saying, oh, no, 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 they meant Cohen. And then when Trump gets up there, it's like, come on, no, they didn't. I mean, just looking at the layout, like you said, the layout of the courtroom, the way it was worded, it was clear that he was talking about uh, Ingram and, and his clerk. So, you know, he, he made the right decision. But, I, you know, it was an interesting week. I mean, I you know, talking a little bit about Haba and Cohen, I, you know, look, I mean, they're both kind of, you know, I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm absolutely not a fan of Haba's at all. And Cohen, I, Cohen strikes me as he's, I mean, at this point he is, it is just seems to have become like an all-consuming rage that animates him when it comes to, to Trump and to see the two of them sort of on the stand. I, you know, Haba did not a bad job. The, the first day, you know, the second day, I think the the state interrupted her flow of questioning a little bit, but she got Cohen when he was on the stand that to admit that he lied to Congress and to a previous judge. And then he said, look, yeah, and in federal court and SDNY Judge Pauly, I lied to Judge Pauly when I admitted to tax evasion crimes. And then he had said that, you know, he admitted to those crimes under pressure from federal prosecutors. But, you know, Habo's clear point was or intent with the questioning was to break down his credibility and to show that he just, you know, couldn't be trusted at all. What he said, you know, on the the same uh, 2019 testimony where Cohen denied recalling any order from the former president to inflate his assets, he said, you know, I don't I don't recall that. But then the day before, how about I got him to say that, look, you know, or this is on direct from the state that Trump had him what he termed, quote unquote, reverse engineer his assets to arbitrarily reach a net worth of his boss's choosing. And then Haba takes the stand and gets him to say, no, I don't I don't remember any order from that. So, uh, you know, she to the extent, you know, whatever complaints you have about her and, you know, sort of her grandstanding and, you know, serving as a as a walking, talking sort of all things that Trump wants to hear. Uh, she did a decent job with Cohen, I thought, undermining his credibility. And then, you know, at the end of her cross, when, when Cohen was done, uh, Trump's lawyers asked for a directed verdict. <laughs> and then Cohen said no. And then Trump had a little fit, like muttered and stormed out, stormed out of the courtroom. Apparently the Secret Service was rushing. I had no idea he was leaving. And so the Secret Service detail was rushing after Trump after he like has his little snit and storms out of the courtroom. He he mumbles something to the to the press corps on the way out about how horrible it is. And Unbelievable. Then, Unbelievable. Yeah. The, and then judge said no, it's <laughs> not just denied, absolutely denied. And, and call the Trump lawyer's motion absurd. Again, things you don't want to hear from a judge is qualifying, uh, denied to absolutely denied and uh, calling a motion absurd and saying, look, this, this, the, the evidence in this case could fill this courtroom, that the, the, the state's case hardly is reliant on Cohen, uh, let alone as, even as a primary part. So uh, the judge, you know, shot that down. I think, again, you know, not that anybody... It, anyone can see the writing on the wall, I think, of where this is going. But to the extent that Cohen, you know, it was certainly an interesting sideshow. I don't know that the resolution of this case is going to turn on him at all. Yeah. And the judge said that. 
I think I think his words would hardly rise. This case hardly rises and falls <laughs> on the word of, of Michael Cohen. It was an interesting uh, choice to put him on the stand. I'm pretty sure that this like, you know, you're right. There's a mountain of evidence here. The judge is right. This doesn't rise and fall on, on Cohen. I think there were important parts of his testimony. And I, I honestly think that the judge is going to base this on the facts. And these are just corroborating testimony. Uh, this is, you know, kind of corroborating testimony to those facts. And that's all I think it's, uh, that the way that it's going to be seen. Um, we do have a couple of, uh, you know, you remember how Andy McCabe refers to uh, what happens after a major trial as mop up cases. Well, I think our D block is mop up stories today because we've got a few random uh, odds and ends to cover. But we do have to take a quick break. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, So this Mike Johnson fella, elected Speaker of the House, pulling Ukraine aid out, uh, just put forward a he he, he at first wanted to do a clean funding of Israel bill, but then they that's not what they put on the floor. They're saying it has to come out of IRS funding. Uh, It's uh, that's never going to fly in the Senate. But anyway, this guy is right way. He's like more MAGA than than Jim Jordan. The only thing he had going for him uh, at the time was that nobody knew who he was. And now everybody is finding out uh, who he is. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no. And it's like somebody, I saw somebody characterize him as a, you know, an oppo researcher's dream. And I think that's right. I mean, part of the deal is like everybody seems, oh, he's not some like mouth breathing blowhard like Jim Jordan. And he's not crazy, you know, ch- child alleged child trafficker like uh, Matt Gates. But I, it, it, at the end of the day, getting the speakership because you seem clean cut and quiet and a holy man when you start digging into that. And it's like, you know, maybe, maybe we should not. It's not just that he's a holy evangelical. I mean, we're talking like extreme evangelism. We're talking about, you know, bringing about the like in Gilead. the days, about, you know, the rapture is upon us. Maybe people who are planning on the end of days aren't those people that we should be putting in charge of important things. But I'm just, I, you know, and all these I think it is going to end up being one because my experience is frequently the people who are the most vocal about wanting to put controls on people's lives and people's morality and what they can think and who they can love and who they can marry. Oftentimes, the most vocal people in that regard tend to have some of the deepest, darkest skeletons in their closet. (laughs) I'm very curious to see as the weight of the entire national press corps turns on Mike Johnson in his past to see what comes up. And there's already weird stuff. Like he has he has an adopted adult black son named Michael who has not appeared in any of his family photos for years. And they're, they're just weird, weird, you know, and he's got these crazy comments about, you know, essentially, well, the problem, all the problems we have with Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid being top heavy with not enough laborers, if more women were just not forced to bring their babies to term, we would have more labor in the workforce and we wouldn't have this upside down problem. I, I mean, they're crazy statements, crazy statements. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there, but there is an endless closet full of skeletons that we are going to start uh, unraveling between now and the election next year. Oh, and by the way, I've, I have set up a fund, Pete, for the 18 Republicans who moderate, you know, quote unquote, moderate Republicans who voted for him, for voted for Mike Johnson. I, I've set up a fund to raise money for their Democratic opponents. And uh, we've over the weekend with our single tweet and our soft launch, we've already raised like thirty five thousand dollars. So if you want to donate to that fund, absolutely. It is uh, swingleft.org slash fundraise slash how we win two zero two four. And that is money. hundred percent of your donation goes directly to the candidates that are running against those 18 Republicans in Biden districts that voted for this guy. Absolutely unbelievable how right wing and scary uh, this guy this guy is. Next up, you know, we're still in the House. We're still a House Republicans. George Santos, <laughs> our good friend. First of all, there's a story out in the Daily Beast by Sullenberger today that his his lawyer just apologized to the FEC saying that he was duped by the treasurer, the fake treasurer of his campaign. So there's even more potential criminality here. Uh, but he was arraigned uh, on his superseding, 10 superseding charges. He's now got 23 felony counts against him. And his trial date has been set. And it is September 9th of next year. Mm. Right, <laughs> right smack up against the election. Um, but he could be expelled 
this week because his New York uh, buddies, his New York uh, Republican buddies, have a resolution. And they say they think they have two thirds votes to expel him from Congress this week. Yeah. And that's where it gets really interesting, right? Because they, they do think you know, there's some indication that they have broad bipartisan support, except the now Speaker of the House, yep. uh, Mike Johnson, is saying, no, I don't want to expel him because we've already got a razor thin majority. And if he leaves, that majority gets even smaller. So again, the paragon of virtue, the Bible quoting the Bible and caring man who apparently has only cracked the Old Testament because nothing about the Sermon on the Mount or any of the Gospels seems to have found its way into the the his mind. But if we're going back to the, the Old Testament, you know, eye for an eye, fire and brimstone, prophets of the Old Testament... That holy man, that man of God, that man who sits there and says, you know, going out of his way to talk about how homosexuality is wrong and and homosexual marriage is an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, George Santos, eh, Alice, we need him. So I, I don't know if I'm going to support throwing him out. So who it, it is clearly such a sham. And that's one thing if you want to. And again, that's another thing that just bugs me when somebody is so just outwardly apparently devout and such a, you know, a quote of every, you know, every book of the Bible at their tongue at the ready, but in saying so many on the one hand, hateful things about LGBTQ rights, marriage, and then at the same time, looking at George Santos and all the stuff that he's accused of say, well, no, but we need to keep men for power. It's absurd. This morality is a bunch of BS in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you've got PDA, handjob, second base, Lauren Boebert, vaping, like totally supporting this guy. You got Matt Gates, Coke, Molly, orgies uh, in the Bahamas supporting this guy. They're the first two to be jailed in a theocracy. Right. <laughs> and you got your right. And your, your candidate, your orange god is raw dogging a goddamn porn star <laughs> in, in the run up to the election, giving payoffs to multiple, you know, <laughs> adult actors or, 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 or you know Playboy performers bunnies, or models film actresses. Mm -hmm. but but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter that all these you know being godly he's he's godly we'll pray for him and pray for for him to continue carrying out god's will we just just mm -hmm. ignore that you know on the one hand the you know lord turns us to you know forgive that that must be it only only donald trump though the rest of the immigrants and all the the, the gays although those people no 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 they're going to hell I, it just fucking aggravates me i'm sorry yeah, I know, I know. We got a little bit of bonus, uh, Pete. We got a little sweary Pete there. That's Yeah, like Pete. <laughs> just at the end. For those of you who stuck through to the bitter end, that's your reward. <laughs> that's your that's your reward. Uh, but that is the kind of, th those are the rants that you're missing if you're not a, a patron at the $2 level and you can hear our extra full, you get a whole extra episode every week and it's like that. Um Minnesota and Michigan currently have uh, potential trials coming up in the uh, the arena of keeping Donald Trump off the ballot using Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, but the trial in Colorado is underway now, this week. Um, it's supposed to be a week-long trial. Uh, you know, after the, the Colorado Supreme Court denied a last-ditch emergency stay, and that's why the trial is now underway. It's, again, a week-long trial before Denver judge it could be a test of whether Trump's opponents elsewhere have a viable path to keep him off the ballot. Now, the, adv uh, the advocacy group that brought the lawsuit, we know them as CREW, the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, said Trump incited, exacerbated, and otherwise engaged in a violent insurrection by encouraging his supporters to march on the Capitol and prevent the certification of Biden's win. Now, we've had, I think, Griffin Cooey was pulled out of his job on, on Section 3, 14th Amendment grounds. You don't have to be convicted or even charged with insurrection or seditious conspiracy. Um, and so uh, that's going to be their number one defense. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Now, Colorado District Court Judge Sarah Wallace has denied five separate bids by Trump and his allies to dismiss the case. She rejected Trump's arguments that courts don't have the power to determine the eligibility for office. So we'll see how this ends up shaking out. Uh, the judge rejected a motion by Trump's lawyers that she step aside and recuse herself because she once gave money to a liberal group. So she said, no, that's not a reason to recuse. And um, by the way, for Minnesota, oral arguments uh, begin there on Thursday. So these cases are going to overlap just a little bit. Uh, I don't have any information on the Michigan one, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's not far behind. Yeah, look, I mean, there's no question in my mind these things are going to go up to the Supreme Court. And I do think the, the Supreme Court, given the, the makeup 
if, again, I had to guess, since we're doing all kinds of guessing today, I think the court is going to want to see some sort of impeachment or conviction for something relating to, you know, a, a crime of that, that sort of like touches some way somehow on the, on the 14th. Um, so if it's only been charged, but not convicted, I think the court's going to be a little hesitant to allow it, but that's, you know, my guess. And the other thing is like, if they wanted to, you know, just the process of, you know, moving this up the chain, the appeal, if you want to slow roll it through the, through the circuit court of appeals, wherever that is, you know, you get the three judge hearing, then you ask for en banc, the Supreme court finally takes it up. They ask for briefings. If they wanted to address this, they could, you know, halt it, allow him to be on the ballot and then not actually hear arguments in the case until after the election was done. So I understand it's rolling along, but I would not, I mean, I'm being, you know, kind of my cynical self, but I don't see this as working out, even though, even though this court, otherwise, you know, you want to talk about districting in North Carolina or wherever that's all states, rights, states, rights, the federal government doesn't have a role, but, but, but when it comes to voting, well, we're going to insert ourselves in that. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, and, and you know, it's up to well, for if he's not in jail, <laughs> and he's actually the nominee for the Republican Party, um, I don't personally think that he will be, uh, or he's going to try to run from jail. I don't know uh, if the if the if the RNC is going to be uh, cool with that. But um, if he is somehow, you know, hey, that's fine. He's the easiest guy to beat, in my opinion. But that's just me. I although I understand you don't even want that to be a potential eventuality. I I feel that. A um, couple other things here. Uh, this is from the uh, from Arizona Central, which the AZ Central, which is uh, a really g- a great publication. I actually um, support this uh, and subscribe to this publication. Uh, you know, my I lived in Arizona for a couple of decades, but. These really great reporters uh, got a bunch of text messages. Let me read this for you. A Michigan lawyer steeped in conspiracy theories helped write the Cyber Ninja's final report to the Arizona State Senate in 2020 for the audit. Remember the Crazy Mm. Times Carnival audit? (laughs) Her name is Stephanie Lambert. We know her as Stephanie Lambert. She led efforts to access voting machines in four states. She wanted Cyber Ninja CEO Doug Logan to say the review found evidence that fake ballots were cast in Maricopa County's election. She was trying to get him to lie in the final report. Lambert repeatedly sought to include the bogus information, even as Logan told her in these text messages that the claims were meritless. Logan told her the claims of fraud she wanted to include did not hold water. Uh, And she didn't like that response. She said, you're killing me. She wrote in a text as Logan's deadline to report to the Senate approached. You need to do this, she said. Logan told her the ballots in question were unlikely fraud. The exchange is among 1,484 texts. Logan sought to hide from the public by blacking out the contents, but a technical error allows for anyone to erase those redactions and make the message visible. Oh. This reminds me. <laughs> Redaction, ninjas. Manaf- Redaction ninjas. Redaction ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me of when Manafort. Hey, if you can't redact something right, maybe you shouldn't be judging whether a ballot is uh, is legal. Uh, but remember when Manafort uh, to, tried to redact stuff by highlighting it in black and people were just able to remove the click and take it out (laughs) yes yes yeah Yeah. it's like and again the point being that like the first time that happens and somebody gets burned it's like oh wow yeah that's kind of a dumb mistake but with like the fourth or fifth time in a very well-known public you know cases where people have managed to screw up adobe but uh you're right you're right this was not this was not an artist colony who was suing over access to a well somewhere this is the head of cyber ninjas, you know, the head of a <laughs> a computer forensic company, you would think if anyone in the world would be able to competently redact something, perhaps it would be them, but no, no, redaction ninjas. I love it. But again, these, these, mm-hmm. Allison, these are the people I worry about, you know, talking about and, and, and talking with Norm earlier in the show, I, I get these bar proceedings about the high level lawyers that those, you know, some are going well, some are not going, going so quickly, but there are all these little nickel dime attorneys, the... You know, the Stephanie Lamberts and the and the um, Catherine Freeze and all Freeze, these folks, yeah. all these mm-hmm. folks who are all over these states, who are part of this big apparatus, not just in any one particular jurisdiction, but across the board. And I really worry 
they may not get picked up at the state level, or if they do, it's just on the context of what they did in that one particular state. And I do worry that Jack Smith has got so much on his plate that he wants to just get through the Trump course, which is huge, and then try and get co-conspirator one through six. And I do worry that there are all these little knuckleheads, the Stephanie Lamberts of the world, that, yeah, they might face some sort of accountability in Michigan, but they were doing stuff all over the U.S. And whether or mm -hmm. not they're ever, and not just criminally, whether or not bars are able to look at the totality of their behavior and take that into account and decide whether or not they should be practicing law or not. I, I just- I'll put I, that I moral turpitude language in there, <laughs> there <you laughs> in their <laughs> indictments. But she was indicted by a Michigan, Michigan grand jury in August for the voting machine stuff. Um, now, she's also one of the 30 unnamed and unindicted co-conspirators in Georgia. We know Arizona, and that's who wrote this, by the way. This article comes from AZ Central. We know Arizona is looking into- um, the, the these schemes as well, and she could be indicted in Arizona. Uh, so it'll be interesting um, to see where this all, uh, how this all shakes out. I, I, I don't know where they fall in the federal investigation. I know they've been investigated, and I know that these uh, state attorneys general and DAs are sharing this information, um, you know, with the feds, but uh, who knows what he's going to do with this uh, or the six unindicted co-conspirators, and when. We'll just have to keep an eye on it. But like I've said repeatedly, because he's a special counsel, Jack Smith has to submit a final report, and he has to put in there declinations, uh, like why he didn't prosecute things that he investigated. Uh, and if those aren't redacted, perhaps we can just simply remove the redaction bars. But, <laughs> but I bet he actually knows how to redact things. But if they aren't, then we'll know. Then we'll know what happened. Uh, it just might be a few years from now. Yeah. And, you know, the deeply sort of conspiratorial sort of person might say, well, maybe Doug Larson actually intended to have those redactions uh, deletable so that, you know, because he was the one, at least the the text that I've seen, he he's not, it's, you know, he's the one trying to say, I don't think there's wrong oh, Logan. here. I don't think, right, 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 right. Logan, right, Logan, Logan, not Larson, sorry. And, and so maybe, you know, did Logan intend for these things to get out and he couldn't just come right out and say it, but I, you know, I don't know, that strikes me as probably a little too, uh, too he would just release them. Right. He would just release them. Although if he did that, you know, and risk the wrath of, of MAGA Nation, I don't know, probably probably not substantively different than what it looks like now. No, that's true. That's true. I, I keep forgetting uh, about that wrath, uh, yet it, it keeps rearing its head again and again. All right, that is our show this week. Those are our little uh, cleanup stories. Except, I mean, I think we have a, uh, an update on Navarro. He's, you know, he's he's been trying to get his case dismissed. His, his this is his f contempt, probably four month jail sentence for a uh, congressional contempt case, saying that the jurors went out for a fresh air break and saw one person with a sign, and so they were influenced, and his whole verdict should be. It should be thrown out. Um, I, I he, that's working its way up uh, the courts so far. He's been losing. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that for you. He may get, um, you know, he's going to file an appeal, and like Bannon, he might get to stay out of jail pending the appeal of that case. It would be kind of hard to jail him uh, and not Bannon uh, because you got to kind of treat similar criminals similarly. But we'll see what ends up happening there. And then the guy, one of the guys in the the three people. Uh, that are in the Ruby Freeman pressure hub of the hub and spoke conspiracy, Rico racketeering criminal enterprise down in Fulton County, Harrison Floyd. Uh, he has filed to have his case dismissed. I don't think that's going to mm -mm. happen uh, for him. Uh, so, uh, but he's filed. I think that the, the not, not Trevion Cootie, not Harrison Floyd, but the third person involved in that scam, whose name is Lee, maybe the next person uh, to cut a deal because, you know, Norm was saying it should, you know, if once we get somebody from the Ruby Freeman pressure thing, we've got every spoke of the conspiracy. I think right. that might be where the pressure is because Bannon's got his hooks into, into Harrison Floyd pretty, pretty hard. So, and he's been able to raise a couple few hundred thousand dollars for him. So he might not be feeling it, you know, quite yet. Uh, well, we'll see. There's also the, the Hampton, uh, Chile, there's a couple of other uh, folks that, that may be able to grab a plea deal there. We'll see, and we'll keep you posted. But that's the show. That's our show today. Any final thoughts, Pete? No, great show. And thanks to Norm again for coming on. I'm just a, a huge uh, reservoir of knowledge and experience. So thanks to him. And we'll see you uh, on the bonus for patrons later this week. Yes, and thank you again to our Hall of Famers. We appreciate you. 
and we'll send out an email pretty soon. We'll have another Q&A coming up uh, for you, a Zoom Q&A happy hour with mocktails and cocktails. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Struck. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.